Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Mondays with Mendy. Thank you for joining us. Go ahead and silence our phones. Tonight we are in for a very interesting discussion because tonight we're going to deal with the new reality that exists in the world around us. And that is a reality that has been shaped by events that have transpired over the last few years, the last three, four years, with the economic meltdown that has taken place here in the United States, and indeed across the world, in Europe and elsewhere, the economic downfall has changed drastically our lives, the lives of our friends and families, literally all across our planet. In fact, uh, right now, a lot of financial indicators tell us that we may be in for uh, a prolonged period of financial difficulty based on what's happening in Europe and so on. It's a new reality. It's a new reality for a lot of people, a lot of people the same age as myself that grew up believing that our financial sector, Wall Street, the stock market was truly invincible, would continue to rise and rise, and was something that we could really tether ourselves to, we could actually believe in, because it was so firmly entrenched in our existence. But alas, we have all woken up over the last few years to a new reality where this bedrock of existence, this foundation of financial stability, is gone. It has literally been ripped away from us, quite painfully for a lot and a lot of people. So when you go through a, a situation as such, you have to start re-examining what is the true foundation that exists inside of our lives. Is there something credible and real that we can attach ourselves to that helps us weather storms and cycles such as the one we've experienced in the last four years. So let's start off with a basic, a basic example. You have inside of your body, you have inside of your body a hundred trillion cells, roughly a hundred trillion cells. Each cell has inside of it a nucleus and it has the entire genetic code, your entire genetic code, built inside of the cell. That's 1.3 billion letters. 1.3 billion letters inside of each cell and there's over a hundred trillion cells. So needless to say, your, uh, <laughs> your body is very detailed and very, very specific. Why am I telling you and sharing with you this information? You're not a geneticist, you're not a chemist or a doctor. Why is it so important to understand the specificity in which God created your body, indeed every person's body? Because tonight, to explain and clarify how we find stability, how we find safety and security in such a difficult an ever-changing world, we're going to look at an, a lesson from the Torah, as we do every week. But tonight's lesson is focused not on a general idea, or a thought, or a chapter, or even a verse, or even a word in the Torah. Rather, tonight's entire discussion is derived and studied from one letter. That's it. One basic, simple, little old letter is going to teach us how to find stability, fortitude, and strength even in an environment as difficult as the one we're experiencing right now. So, the Torah is comprised of over 300,000, 304,000 letters, lots and lots of letters, and each one is valuable and credible and teaches us something very, very powerful. And that is why when we study Torah, we study it from a very detailed perspective, 
coming at it with the belief that every single letter in it is specifically there. However, there are a couple of instances in the Torah where the way you write it and the way you read it is different. There are a handful of times where we write a word a certain way, and yet when we read it, for example, Shabbat afternoon, or even amongst ourselves, we read it in an entirely different manner. And that is transmitted from teacher to child, all the way from Moses to Joshua. So Moses wrote down the Torah in a specific fashion, but when he transmitted and taught it, there are a couple of places where he taught it slightly differently. We're going to look at one of those instances to try and understand how we find strength and stability in this time. So we're all familiar with the term the Jubilee. The Jubilee is when we celebrate 50 years. That is what the Jubilee is. But where does the term Jubilee come from? In fact, it is entirely a Jewish term. The term Jubilee comes from the Torah, from the Hebrew word Yovel. From the Hebrew word Yovel comes the word Jubilee. What is the Yovel? The Yovel was a 50-year celebration. The Jewish people arrive in Israel after traveling through the desert. Joshua leads them into Israel. They spend seven years vanquishing Israel of its enemies, and then another seven years to establish each person with their specific lot and their specific portion in the land. Finally, after 14 years, it's time for them to start settling the land and enjoying its fruits and enjoying its labor. So God tells the Jewish people that you shall start counting from this point on, and after 50 years, 50 years from this point, you will make a year of Jubilee. What will happen during the year of Jubilee? A couple of things. So during the year of Jubilee, anything that was sold previously, in the previous 50 years, any transaction of land and property that was done, is annulled and all property reverts back to its original owner. I know what you're thinking. Real estate must have been really complicated then. And you're right, it was complicated. And prices and values changed based on the fact that you knew that you were only really leasing it, land leasing it for 50 years. Additionally, any loans that a person had were absolved and Slaves, any person that might have had uh, servants of such, they were automatically freed and redeemed. So every 50 years, land went back to its rightful owner, debts were absolved, and uh, servants were automatically freed. This is what happened every 50 years. However, there is one exception. If a person lives in a land, a walled city, and they sold property during that 50-year period. The Torah tells us that you have one year to renege on your transaction, and get a refund, get your property back. But after that year, the property transaction is final, and it does not change back even during the 50-year period. So again, during the 50-year period, everyone's property goes back to its original owner, except if you bought or sold property in a walled city. For example, Jerusalem is a walled city. Told this very day, if you go to the old city of Jerusalem, it is surrounded by an entire wall. Jericho, which is an area we don't really visit because it is part of the West Bank and uh, entirely, uh, entirely closed off to Jews. Jericho is another walled city, and so on. So, don't worry, if you bought or sold property in Chicago or Los Angeles or even good old beautiful Tampa, you're fine. But in, in walled cities uh, in, in Israel, it would not stand past the 50-year jubilee, unless it was in a walled city. Why is it that homes sold in a walled city are different and have a different status than a home that is sold in the rest of Israel? If you tell me that there should be no uh, permanent ownership, it should apply to the entire land. 
And if you feel that a person should be able to sell by himself, that should also be applicable to the entire land. Why do we make this difference, this separation? So there are many different commentaries and explanations. We'll just go through a couple of them because they are quite, quite interesting. People say that the reason, the, the Book of Education says that the reason that they were given one year in the walled city to uh, re, re, uh, rescind their transaction is so that they would understand that really you shouldn't sell any property in the land of Israel and will give you one, especially not in a walled city because they were considered holier cities. And so we'll give you one year, that way you'll be wise enough to quickly run and resend your transaction. Additionally, people would typically, they would live off of the fruit of the land. So if I sold property to you because I was desperate, but I need that property to live, so we know that after 50 years, I would get that property back or sooner at the 50 year celebration. This was the way that the Torah helped make sure that everyone always was able to support themselves because they always had their land coming back to them. But if you live in a walled city, where it's not about your land that had nothing to do, then again, there would not be any requirement to have it go back at the 50-year celebration. Additionally, the walled cities were cities that were there to protect all the inhabitants. If there was a war, God forbid, everyone would come and live inside the walled city. But if the, those that lived permanently in the walled city were constantly changing and going back and forth every jubilee, then they would not be intimately aware of how to protect the city and all the inhabitants that were seeking refuge inside of it. So anyone that lived in the walled city really had to stay there and that's what the Torah encourages them to do. So we have all these vastly different uh, explanations, but the fundamental concept is to understand that you are living in a land, you are living in a, in a world that is not permanently yours. It's not permanently yours. God gives us the world around us. He gives us land. He gives us homes and foods so that we can sustain ourselves. But we don't own them necessarily. They are there to provide us with what we need in order to accomplish our task and our mission. Period. End of story. And so therefore in Israel, during this biblical period, every 50 years the Jewish people were reminded that this property was not there for them to take ownership permanently, but rather if it came into their, uh, in their domain, they were there to use it and profit from it, and then subsequently it reverted back to its original owner. So here in this concept, which is discussed at great length, we have a interesting dilemma. Now, stay with me for a second. The Torah tells us, and I quote, Walled cities are different than non-walled cities. For in a walled city, it could be sold eternally. But when it says, if his house is walled, the word for his is low. And that same word also means no. So you can actually translate the same verse, his, his house, his... Uh, in the walled city, or you can say the non-walled city. Either his walled city or the non-walled city. So in fact, the Torah is read to, to mean that it is referring to non-walled cities. That a person that doesn't live in a walled city, he sells his house, it goes back after the Jubilee. But the way you read that word is different. The way you read that word, the definition changes completely. And it becomes his walled city. So if you own a home in his walled city, it goes back after 50 years, which is contrary to what we just read. So the first thing we have to understand is how is it that we have two, we have a way of reading the, the verse, we have a way of saying the verse and they completely contradict the other. One says low, as in his walled city, teaching us that cities that are not walled do return after the Jubilee. The other one says low with an Aleph, as in a non-walled city, that a 
even a non-walled city also uh, would not be subject to the 50-year jubilee. All right. So to understand this concept and understand why we have two completely different ways of looking at this basic simple concept, and remember, the entire difference hangs on one letter. Either you use you say lo with an aleph, or you say low with a vup, but it comes down to one letter. Now, the Torah in the process of teaching us the Jubilee is, is conveying to us how important it is to know that our material, corporeal, physical existence is completely transient and temporary. It goes, it comes, you feel strong one day, weak the next day, and it can't be completely solidified ever. Your physical existence will never be completely solid because the physical world is a creation. It's a concept that God created in order to fulfill a specific task. So even though you may feel that you've got shares in different stocks and in mutual funds, and you've got three houses in Miami and New York and Israel, and uh, you're a big macher, you give money to the UJA and to the Federation and to Israel Bonds and to Chabad, right? You're a big this, you're a big that. The reality is that we all experience moments in our life when we reevaluate, we reprioritize. We're forced to take what we knew to be the most important and put it a little bit lower down on the ladder. Something happens that pushes us out of our comfort zone and compels us to refocus our lives. As King Solomon wrote in Kohelas and Ecclesiastes, he wrote, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything, really, it's all vanity. What is the point? If not for a positive and productive purpose, can you really say that anything else is truly meaningful, that you can't live without it, of course you could. Of course you could. So we have to start to refocus the way we look at things and understand that it's not about GM or Chrysler or any other big blue chip company. Those institutions, as successful as they may be, are susceptible to total meltdown and total change. As we saw just in the last couple of years, the auto industry was considered the stalwarts of American ingenuity and engineering, and with the economic meltdown, they almost disappeared. They almost disappeared. So just like in the times of the Jubilee, a person that wanted to sell property, keep their property, and believe that their property would never have to revert back to its original owners in 50 years, what would they do? They would put themselves in a walled city. If they went to buy property in a walled city, they felt that these walls would keep them special, and these walls would, would allow them to take permanent ownership over their physical existence. Same too, we build walls for ourselves. We build walls to protect ourselves, to build a level of denial where we start to believe that it's all about us. And the wall holds back anything of spiritual connection, of understanding the teamwork that exists in society around us, and we become more and more isolated, believing all along that we've done everything that you see around us. It's all thanks to my creativity, my ingenuity, my hard work, my intelligence. That's what made this success possible. And so many Jewish people would try to buy property in the walled city so that they could escape these laws of the Jubilee. Just like this human being living in the modern century, in the 21st century, saying to himself, I will build large walls. I will put so much physical physicality into my life that eventually I will be completely removed from any spiritual connection. And therefore, I will not feel guilty. I will not feel compelled. I will simply be completely and utterly removed. But 
At some point, those walls will come crumbling down, just as they did now. Those walls are built on something that is transient. That physical success, it's here for a reason sometimes, and it's gone for a different reason other times. It's not something that we can entirely rely on, and it's definitely not something we can revolve our, raw, our lives around. And this is the lesson that we are here to learn. As it says, the Maharal of Prague, Rabbi Yehud Lowy, who built the Golam, wrote, Do not crave the table of kings, for your table is greater than their table. The wealth of Torah is greater than the wealth of kings, because the Torah is eternal. And in contrast, the wealth of kings is material and subject to deterioration and loss. So he said it quite clearly. You may think, and you may look out at your window and say, Oh my gosh, that guy, I wish I was him. He's got all of the money in the world. He's got a great job. I wish, I wish, I wish. But the reality is that the grass is hardly ever greener. Hardly, hardly ever greener. And eventually, all physical things come and go. If you think for a moment about all of the different countries that have come before us and have expressed their immortality, such as the Romans and the Greeks, and yet they don't exist today. Communism, Nazism, for the most part, is largely non-existent in today's society. And why is that? Why is it that even with the Berlin Wall, when it was standing right there in the middle of Berlin, separating West and East Germany, and communism was rearing its ugly head, freedom won over. Freedom won over. As Ronald Reagan, President Reagan, said, you cannot stop freedom. And when he called on Mr. Gorbachev to tear down those walls, indeed, shortly thereafter, they were torn down. So we're reminded constantly, every single day, that this world around us, it's not about those material, physical, transient things, because they can't ultimately hold safety and security for us. Because they too come one day and are gone the next. So how do we maintain an eternal connection? How do we maintain a level playing field, a stable and secure life in a world that is so insecure and so unstable? So it comes down to the basic question of whether you have the olive. That little olive changes the entire story about the wall city. If you have the olive, then you don't need a wall because you have penetrated every aspect of your human physical being. And you understand that that physical being is there to be nurtured along with your spiritual identity, creating an inseparable, unstoppable team between the physical and the spiritual. That is your job. And that is why you were put down here on this earth. And if that becomes your focal point, your mission in life, then you are truly unstoppable. Nothing will sway you. No fad, no cool idea, nothing will be able to stop you because the physical and all of its obstacles that it throws out at you, it's not the real thing. It's not truth. It doesn't last and exist over time. But rather, the Aleph, the tradition, the Torah study especially, has that potential to maintain and sustain us in and out every single day. Just to highlight how important Torah study is in continuously holding on to our chain, dating back to our parents, and perpetuating our way of life, our morals and our values to our kids. There's a story that's told about the Roman Empire when it seized Israel and Jerusalem. It says that the emperor said, the emperor finally decided that he was going to capture Jerusalem, so he sent Vespasian, who later on became Caesar, he sent Vespasian to Jerusalem, who besieged the city for three years, a long, long time. There were three wealthy men in Jerusalem, Nakdimon, Ben Kalba, and Ben Sitzit. And each one said, you know what, I will supply the entire city of Jerusalem with wheat, I will supply with barley, and I will supply with wine. So between them, because they were so wealthy, they felt they could sustain the siege and provide for the people inside until they were able to fight back. What happened is that the Biryoni, which was a zealot band of Jewish people that felt that under no circumstances should we make any compromise, any peace 
with the Romans. So they fought, even though the Romans wanted, the rabbis wanted to deal and negotiate with the Romans, they argued you cannot talk to them. And they ultimately burned all of the storehouses that existed in this area. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai was the leader of the Jewish people at the time. He saw what was happening. He spoke to the leader of these zealots, and they said, no, we cannot talk. Even you, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, no one can be allowed to leave. Of course, he understood the gravity of the situation. So what he did was he had his two students carry an empty coffin with him breathing in a small container attached to the bottom of the coffin. And he convinced the uh, zealots guards at the gate to allow him to go through so he could be buried in his family's hometown tomb. The minute that Rabbi Yochan ben Zakkai exited from the walled city of Jerusalem, he immediately sought out the Vespasian, the Caesar, the general. And he turns to the men and he says to him, I am here in peace. And so right away he says, okay. He says, yes, king, I am here to work out a deal with you. Vespasian got very angry and he said, first of all, how dare you call me king? I'm not a king nor even emperor. Indeed, there was somebody else that was emperor at the time. Within a minute, word had come from Rome. The messenger rode up. And sure enough, just the night before, the emperor had died and Vespasian had been chosen by the Senate in Rome to become the new emperor. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. So he hears this message and he looks at Rabbi Yochanan and he starts to understand that this is not just an average guy. Then he sat down and tries to put on his boots and he couldn't put on his boots. So he turned to Rabbi Yechon and said, why can't I put on my boots? And he says, well, that's because it says in the Torah that when you hear a positive or good news, it causes you to swell. So he turned to the rabbi and said, why, what should I do? He says, well, you should hear some despair and distraught. That will shrink you back down to size. And sure enough, he tried it and he was able to put on his shoes. So what did Rabbi Yechon and Zakai ask for? He said, listen. I know that God has given Jerusalem to you and will allow you to destroy it. But I want you to promise me that you will save me three things. You will save the scion of the house of Rabban Gamliel. They were the, no, the, the noble representatives, their family. You will save and give me doctors for the old man, Rabbi Tzadok. And you will save the town of Yavne, which was a few hundred miles away. Which is, and that was the center for Torah study in Israel. It wasn't in Jerusalem, it was in Yavne. And sure enough, Vespasian granted these three requests. And the rabbis were very much conflicted because they argued, said to themselves, You had an opportunity to ask for anything. Why'd you ask him to spare the base of Mekdash, spare the temple? Why didn't you ask him to let all the Jewish people go? Why would you only ask that he spare these three requests? So, of course, hindsight is twenty twenty, and we can always guess and think and so on and so forth. But the reality is that Rabbi Yechonah Zakkai understood something much greater than just the simple physical hardships that the Jewish people experience. Yes, many were killed and many were turned into slaves, and yes, the temple was destroyed. But because that town of Yavne, the center for Torah study, was preserved and protected, the Torah was taught, and Jews continued to give and get education. And that maintained our connection to our faith and our very existence over these 2,500 years. So it's true that we may think sometimes, no, there are other things that are more important in our life. We have to worry about them. Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, Morgan Stanley, GM, Chrysler, Bear Stearns, Freddie Mac. We all believe that these were the core things in our lives. And if they made a move, we could bank on it. No longer is that the case. We now have come to understand that these are not real walls that will impugn us, that will keep us uh, separated from our, our everyday obligations. Eventually, it will catch up with us. So what we have to do is we have to get ahead of it. We have to get ahead of it and understand that, well, yes, we need to live a physical life and we need to do it successfully. 
and comfortably. At the same time, we need to remind ourselves constantly that that is not the ultimate of existence. And sometimes we may travel 45 minutes to put up ourselves with someone and understand that it was worth the 45 minutes because this is what it's all about. This is what it is all about. As it says in the prophet's Malachi, I, God, have not changed, and you, the sons of Yaakov, have never ceased. God is God, the Jewish people are the Jewish people, and yet, as we approach Shavuot, and we're reminded of the time when we stood at the mountain, and we said, we'll do it, we will accept the Torah, and then we will start to read and explore and learn more and more about what our obligations are. That's what we have to start focusing on. That God has given us a Torah to be proactive, to be a voice of spirituality here in this world. And whatever situation we're in, that has to be the number one thing in our mind. Not food, not water, nothing physical in this world is as important, as meaningful as that spiritual existence. And if you choose to make this your number one goal in life, this your priority, this your measuring stick for what everything else is measured, then you too can find this connection, this value in your lives because it is always there buried deep down inside of you. You only have to reveal it. So I wish you much success in refocusing your life and remind you that yes, this is cyclical and yes, you will be blessed and you will do well business-wise, financially, and you will make back the money that you may have lost, but never lose sight of the lesson that you've learned, that these things come, they go, but what's inside over here, that is truly forever. Thank you for joining us tonight and drive safe always. Of course, you can send emails, questions, comments, critiques, quirps to askmendy at gmail.com, A-S-K-M-E-N-D-Y at gmail.com. Next week on Monday, we will talk about the Kabbalah of cheesecake. What's the fuss over milk and meat? So I understand kosher animals, they should be clean, blah, 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 blah. But what does milk and meat affect my dietary habits? Join us to find out more. And of course, Shavuot is coming up in two weeks, two weeks from yesterday. We hope to see you there. Have a wonderful evening.